and thank you for joining us. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. And today we're talking about women and media and often uncomfortable, distressing relationship, especially with black women. Here in conversation with us, Jamia Wilson, executive director of Women Action and the Media, an activist grassroots organization that's been holding the media's feet to the fire for a long time expertly. And Jamia herself for over a decade, even though you're so young, but a decade of work in the media. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Right. And, I, and we should say that, that I've known Jamia for a while. In fact, whenever you know, I have to go to speak to young people, I drag her along. <laughs> I have on one momentous occasion where she was a big hit, but just you know your your engagement with young women, with feminist women uh, around the media, and what needs to be done is just tremendous. So thank you for the work that you know that you're doing. Thank you. It's an honor and an honor to work with you. Well, we always start by asking our guest uh, to talk about their place in Black America, where they grew up, what the influences were, and yours is a very interesting international one, Saudi Arabia and yes. South Carolina. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yes, so I am from the South originally, and even though I've lived all over the world, I always say Southern bred, Southern raised, that those values, the Southern black family values, that lineage is a deep part of my soul and, and what makes me me. I went to Saudi Arabia when I was five and a half years old, and that's also one of my homes, even though it's not my homeland. I moved there with my parents after living in a town where my parents were both tenured professors at a historically black college and had very much been in this wonderful community of black intellectuals and activists and then brought to Saudi Arabia on the other side of the world, which was a completely different experience, but beautiful in its same right. And then when my parents still remained in Saudi Arabia, I actually traveled back to the States and went to boarding school and was living on my own in that community for several years in high school because at that time I wasn't allowed to go to Saudi Arabian school or mm -hmm. to there wasn't American school past the ninth grade. So that's also been an interesting part of my journey, having one foot in Saudi Arabia and one foot back here before I came back here permanently. Right, right. Really interesting. It gives you a global aspect, uh, you know, a view of what the world is like uh, and certainly perhaps unique uh, uh, to a lot of a lot of people. So uh, but but what was the influence that you're this great media influencer now? Uh, uh, what brought you to that? Christiana Manpour really inspired me. I watched her mainly because for the longest time we didn't have cable and there was censored media access and she was one of the faces that I saw most often and one of the only women faces that I'd seen and she was speaking truth about what was happening in the world but with a perspective that I thought was nuanced the kind of nuance that I wasn't hearing when I was home on vacations in the states about Middle Eastern affairs mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the kinds of questions I would get about Saudi Arabia and other places in the region when I would go back to the States troubled me, even at a very young age. So Christiana Manpour inspired me, and I recently heard Huma Abedin from Hillary Clinton's campaign speaking about growing up in Saudi Arabia too, and Christiana Manpour being her personal hero and inspiration. And so I think that there's something about that, that if your access to media is largely hard news media, that those women play a large role in shaping your role models and, and who what you see as possible for yourself. Sure, and Christiane was pretty much a, a solo uh, journalist, solo woman journalist for many, many years, certainly the premier one. Uh, so if there had been, and as the years went on, there were other women, but in the beginning, it was Christiane or no one in terms mm -hmm. of women. Absolutely, and especially in that region at that time, I felt that there was no one else who was really doing that work, who was speaking in a language that I understood. and that she was a trailblazer. And I've often said that I did wonder why there weren't black women that I could see in that role, that that was a question for me. But I was excited by that challenge that I actually said, I think in one of my college essays, that I was going to be that black woman <laughs> who was a right. war correspondent and who was doing that work, which didn't end up being the track that I went on. But I think that it was in the root of the trajectory I've been on now that, uh, that wanting to report differently, that mm -hmm. desire to 
question also in a different mm -hmm. way with nuance mm -hmm. came from that. So Women Action in the Media, uh, talk to us about, this is your current route. You've also done the Women's Media Center and TED. Uh, you were the storyteller there. A really wonderful, rich uh, professional life. Uh, what are the things that you're working on specifically now? Thank you. Women Action in the Media has been wonderful. I actually was a part of WAM, as we call it, whamming as a verb, part of WAM as a member for years. And when I moved to New York City, where one of the first WAM chapters ever started, that community of women really helped me understand that I had a tribe, that I before had felt like my interests didn't necessarily have a group of people who were aligned with them. And I found, oh, there's a whole group of people in the world who are media professionals and media activists who want to come together and make change, that they want to create media. In addition to interrogating it and making the existing media landscape better, I want to be a part of that. And the grassroots nature of it is really what inspired me to be a part of that movement, as well as the fact that it was founded by a woman who was a part of another community, a bookstore community. So Jacqueline Friedman. Jacqueline Friedman. Right, right. And there had been a conference that emerged for the, the WAM conference from that, yeah. and that she took on that leadership to bring WAM to life as a movement. And I was inspired by that, too, that Jacqueline mm -hmm. had, had done that and that she had believed in the idea and the community to, in order to enliven it. And something about her presence and authenticity in that mm -hmm. really inspired me. If for those who don't know Jacqueline, she's written amazing books. She has a very strong and powerful voice and she has a tattoo of the word brave on her arm. <laughs> <laughs> and that encapsulates all that is about her. But I was really inspired by her leadership and really thinking about what could be brave about me by taking on a role like that. All right. Well, you, you know, one of the things that, that was created at a WAM conference in Boston was the Progressive Women's Voices program at the Women's Media Center. And because I was there and I said, you know what we need to do? We just need to train women to go out and engage, do the battlefront work uh, in media. And that happened at WAM. So, you know, Amazing. continue on. You and I were recently at the Hillary Clinton uh, big bash at the Brooklyn Navy Yard after she clinched the, the Democratic nomination. Your, your th thoughts afterwards now about that, that evening? I am basking in the glow of the energy that we were a part of last night, participating in and also witnessing. History was made last night and I am so excited about the future. All of the people who I saw cheering when they saw the entrance video before the secretary claimed the nomination, watching the women's liberation movement, all of our ancestors before us, Shirley Chisholm, mm. Asian American women, trans women talking about their future and how that was wrapped up in this position, in this new way of understanding women's leadership in this country. I'm just completely emboldened by it and excited about possibilities for the future. Yeah, I'm interested in, in, in your elaborating on the fact that you've gotten feedback from several black women who didn't feel that way about last night's or that recent victory. Uh, what, what do you say to them? And what, and what did they say to you, first of all, that, that that wasn't us and so we can't be that excited about all of that? I heard, I heard some questions mostly on social media and some, from some people that I know about what does this mean for us because she has a certain affluence, she's not a woman of color, hasn't experienced our experiences, says this doesn't mean that we are going to be able to ascend to this sort of positioning and power within this country. And I believe that those are valid concerns and I understand them and I understand the very roots of that from an intersectional standpoint. But what I also understand is that the first thing that came to my mind yesterday when I saw her take, the realm, take that space was yes, Next one will be a black woman. Next one will be a Latina. I want to see a Native American president of this country, Native American Supreme Court justice, or all of the Supreme Court being Native American women, or all sorts of people who represent the fullness of who we are. And this was one step on a larger trajectory, but her knocking that glass down and shattering that glass ceiling, as the metaphor was used constantly that night, brought us a step closer. And I think now that we've had an African American president and we've had a woman president, that's opening the door for us to take that next step. Yeah, you're very optimistic that we're going to have that woman president. We still have a few months to go. But yes, <laughs> but I am right, optimistic. Closer, I'll take it. You know, <laughs> as they say, I will take it. Uh, you, you've talked about the uh, intersectionality of uh, of race and class and gender. 
Uh, we have a clip you did uh, for Race Forward, a wonderful organization. I love Rinko Sen. Uh, but let's take a listen to that. Even though race is a social construct and we know that genetically there is no such thing as race, it's this very powerful, powerful illusion that's been perpetuated and used to kill people. It's been used to justify war. It's been used to enslave people. It's been used to force people into indentured servitude. And to disregard that history is disrespectful to all the people who suffered and fought for me to be able to live closer to freedom today. So you, you describe yourself as a black feminist, which, which some people say that's not possible. Talk a little bit about black women being feminists. I, before I had the word feminist, was surrounded by black feminists in my life. The feminist mystique, I remember learning about that in high school and learning about this book that Betty Friedan wrote about white women mainly experiencing this mystique, this problem that had no name and wanting to experience more in their lives about being in the workplace and the separation from domesticity. And I thought, all the women that I've ever known in my life have always been working and they have always been carrying a lot on their shoulders. And that isn't necessarily an encapsulation of the experience of my people. Their voices just haven't been amplified about the work they're doing. And so for me, I think that as people have started to have broader conversations beyond communities of color about what intersectionality really means, what it means to think about feminisms, I like to say that in terms of a right. plural, many different approaches to how we look at equality that really embrace the fullness of our lives, we've been able to be more expansive about that definition. So to be a black feminist, that means that I'm honoring me. I'm honoring my ancestors. I'm honoring my community and the collective. I'm honoring the people who sacrificed so that I could have freedom. And beyond any other connotations that are being attached to it or imposed by external factors, being a black feminist is really about understanding my birthright. Mm. And that birthright is to be able to move forward toward liberation with my people. And that includes women and that includes people of color. So, uh, but do you get pushed back on that? What's, what's the conversation like? You do a lot of online uh, corresponding, I should say, with people who, uh, uh, who sometimes are not so nice about their response to this kind of thing. Talk to us a little bit about online harassment and this new way of, of, of conversation online about these kinds of things. Yes, now we have been dealing with toxic levels of online harassment and abuse. I like to say that the IP address has become the new white sheet, that the Ku Klux Klan has had the white sheet to use harassment intimidation for years to hide behind it in order to impose their will on people and in order to hide in the shadows and try to push people into silence. And now you have people who are hiding behind IP addresses or fake avatars and using those to harass and intimidate in order to silence as well. And so for me, online harassment is really a free speech issue. It's about marginalizing the voices of people who are largely unheard or made invisible in the, in the larger public discourse. Yeah, well, what are the defenses for this? Because um, even after Hillary's uh, uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard, you know, clinching of the, of the Democratic nomination, there was huge uh, response, negative response to that. Of course, positive, but negative online. And a lot of women saying, I'm not leaving my house, I'm not posting, I'm not doing anything for a week or two until this dies down because of the the, the f physical threats against them. I think that it speaks a lot about our culture. It says that we're in a culture right now where misogyny and racism have been normalized and it's unacceptable, but we have to take a stand and calling it out and creating solutions to make it so that all of us can speak and live freely. One of the things that I think is very problematic is I heard about people getting yard signs vandalized yesterday. And I think that's a perfect real time example of what's also happening online that mm -hmm. people should be able to express their ideas. If we really value free speech and we really value democracy, which I think a lot of the people who are harassing others online claim to say that they stand for, then we can't marginalize other people's voices. We can't use harassment. We can't use intimidation to push people who may disagree with us or our worldview into the shadows. And largely, I think one real problem for me has been that a lot of the people who I've had attack me online have been people who 
have a view of the world that makes it seem that if I gain something, like more access mm -hmm. to equality, it means that something's being taken away from them. Mm -hmm. If I speak about an experience about my culture, my gender, my experience, and it doesn't center who they are in the narrative, then that is seen as a threat. So a big part of this mm -hmm. is about who has privilege, who has power, who has heard and recognized when they speak and who is often dismissed and who's not listened to and really acknowledging that and naming it so that then we can move forward with solutions to change it. So it seems to me that, that it's a double-fronted need here. Policing, what, what's the response? What's the protection uh, from that? And then the deeper issue of changing our culture. Are you optimistic that that is possible, that the hate and misogyny that's been unearthed uh, is possible to tamp back down again? I believe that it is possible because we deserve better and we can do better. And I have an optimistic view of humanity, but I do believe that just what we saw last night, what we saw with the election of President Obama, what we've seen with many of the gains that we've made, even though there's still a lot of work to do, shows us that culture can and will change. I was just thinking about the fact that my husband and I couldn't have been married in the state that I was born in 50 years ago, legally. Because he's not because black. Because he's, he's not black. Right. And that's changed. And that is something that I don't know if people at that time would have thought would have changed within culture either. And so I think that there's a lot of work we have to do, but that the majority of people do want equality and the majority of people want equal access, ownership and participation for all of us. It's really about uplifting those voices and the power of the majority of us who do believe in freedom for all. So speaking of uplifting voices, uh, you are a speaker at the United State of Women, this huge 5,000 person gathering uh, by uh, President Obama and Michelle Obama. Uh, let's uh, take a look at the video that they put out, which I think is very, very impactful. We are the United State of Women. The United State of Women. The United State of Women. And when we do better, everyone does better. You with us? Then listen up. When we work, we get paid. The same as everyone else. Doing the same job. We will be the boss. Of a company. Of our company. Of a whole empire. Sounds good, right? We, 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 we are the United State of Women. Somos el Estado Unido de la Mujer. We are in charge of our own bodies. Every beautiful part. Every powerful part. Every which way. We want to use them. It's our choice when to say yes and when to say no. Because duh. Literally duh. We're earning more college degrees than ever. We're coding like it's nobody's business. Doing whatever we want. Like it's nobody's business. Because we have ideas. Game-changing ideas. World-changing ideas. This is our movement. Turning struggle into strength. We're not done. We're definitely not done. So when we stand, stand with us. We are the United State of Women. The United State of Women. And we stand stronger when we stand together. Today, we'll change tomorrow. Together, we got this. We got this. So, so that's a treme tremendous effort. Uh, your, your task is to address the issue of who gets to speak in the media. Uh, tell us a little bit about your presentation. I'm really looking forward to speaking about this. I'm going to be talking about who gets to speak in the media as well as media activism and to explain why we do get to have a say. There have been a lot of people who've asked me questions about the media and saying, oh, there's nothing we can really do. There's no control that we have as people who aren't media makers over the cultural conversation. And I'm looking forward to having that conversation at the White House Summit to say there is so much we can do to influence media through direct action and rapid response campaigns, as well as by creating our own media and supporting 
diverse voices in making that media, supporting the next generation in making that media, supporting people of color in making media, and also supporting new development of data that really represents the fullness of who we are and how media is impacting us so that we can really understand where the change needs to be made most fully. So whenever you're talking about statistics data, yeah, uh, we've, it seems to me that the, it's been the same for a decade at least. Uh, you seem to think that, that there is a nuance that we're not getting at when we say only 5% of the cloud pos positions in media belong to women and in every field for, for that matter, mostly. Uh, what's, what's the nuance that we need to, to get to? We need intersectional data. And this is a term that was coined by Jacqueline Wernemont, Latoya Peterson, and myself at a convening at Harvard where we were talking about online harassment and counter speech in these issues uh, around making free expression more possible for all of us online. And this intersectional data would be messier data, so to speak, that would really make it so that all of the identities that we have are represented, so that we're not just counting our gender, we're not just counting our race, our class, but we're really using a grassroots approach in collecting this data. And we're also collecting data in ways that align with the ethics of liberation and equality. So we'll recognize there, there are communities that are being surveyed in ways that are inappropriate and dangerous to them. We There are communities who it's not safe for them to participate in these sorts of studies. And the way that the Such data as. is collected, who so for example, be? trans people mm. who may be asked identifying information that could have implications for them or undocumented immigrants, for example, as well, who might be in the same position. And how is it that we can gather the data about how they're experiencing harassment, how they're experiencing barriers to expression and access and ownership, and also make sure that we're not creating a larger problem. And so those are some examples to really have a more nuanced way to collect this data, to gather it and also speak about it. And that will help us develop solutions that really, really help. So uh, as storyteller at TED, you know, uh, talk to us about, you want people to be able to come forward to tell their stories and through those stories, uh, change will happen. Make that connection for, for us. I wish I were more optimistic about that and, I, and I'm counting on you all to make this happen, but I'm, I'm not as a, an avid a supporter anymore of the story because we've been doing this for a long time. Talk. I really believe in the power of story and I think a big part of that came from a class that I took in college years ago. It was about the African-American narrative tradition. And that class really inspired me to think about where is it that I found a lot of my values? Where is it that I was moved to action. And that was because a lot of stories were passed down to me about my history, that my parents took it upon themselves to fill in the gaps that I wasn't getting in school. And I believe that a lot of the digital content creation right now, the memes, storytelling that's happening in videos, it's filling in the gaps. I mean, there's also there's a lot of things out there that are problematic, right. but the, the good stories, that the stories that are being revealed that would otherwise be unheard, they are illuminating different conversations that are helping us to shape a new cultural narrative. And it takes time. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like slow medicine. I see it in that way. Slow, slow medicine. medicine. <laughs> so you'll hear functional medicine doctors, for example, talk about slow medicine. Well, they'll say, when you're taking these supplements and you're eating right, it's not going to work as quickly as an antibiotic. But that antibiotic might have <laughs> symptoms <laughs> that right. might not give you a longer term recovery. But when we are having more open conversations with more nuance, when we are really digging into the issues with dignity, that that does impact culture and it, and it impacts the way that we mm -hmm. see the world. I, I know personally, I'll think about my husband as an example, and I asked him about how he learned that he had white privilege. I was really interested in that since he grew up in New Hampshire in a school that had one person of color. And he said that he watched a documentary on PBS and that documentary is how he learned that white privilege existed. And it was really about watching a very emotional and powerful conversation that people of various races were having that he realized that he'd never had to think before about the sorts of things and dangers and threats that people of color had, had to experience. And, and how, how are you negotiating that in your, is a personal question, but sure. for someone who, whose uh, understanding of privilege is evolving and you've known it for a while, how does that work? 
I think that, and someone has told me that this is kind of a morbid view, but I think it's one that's very empowering for me, is that I acknowledge that he will never understand the fullness of my experience as a black woman. But that's not something I could expect from someone who'd look exactly like me or have exactly the same background as myself to understand the fullness of my experience as a woman. And I really believe that it's important to have conversations and to call in privilege when I see it or to call in abuses of privilege when I see it because sometimes people might not be aware but to also have deep listening and dialogue about the experiences of people who do have this privilege to really mm -hmm. kind of unpack and understand sometimes their reasoning um, behind certain beliefs that they have because I know that one conversation we had that really stuck with me was about what it really meant to not have to think about these issues in a comprehensive way and then need to think about them a lot when he was making observations about how people were right. treating him in relationship to me and how he saw people treat me on a regular basis in different ways than he was treated. And that was something that has given us a lot of really powerful and sometimes painful conversations, but I think that they're helpful not only to us, but to the world. I've seen his dialogue with his friends impacted because of it, and I think that's a great thing. Well, we, we're running out of time here, unfortunately. You'll have to come back. But we always uh, end to. by asking our, our guests to finish the sentence, the strength, the power of black America lies in, what would you say that is? There's so much about our strength and power that I could speak about. But, and I love this question, but I really believe that our power and our strength lies in our inherent belief in our dignity and in our inheritance of a birthright to liberation and freedom. And to hold that close no matter what and no matter who tells us that we don't have a right to it, we do. And I think that's the best lesson I've ever gotten from my mother and I carry it with me every day. So it's, it's believing in your right. Yes. Great. Well, Jamia Wilson, we thank you so much for being with us today. Continue holding media to the, to the fire, putting their feet to the fire. Thank we're so you. glad you were with us here today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The show is Black America. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you the next time.